Hey guys, good to be here. Um, so I'm uh, Mick, co-founder of Geyser, Stelios. Hi everyone. The other co-founder. And uh, here we're talk we're here today to talk to you about something um, um, a bit esoteric um, called just the idea of interoperability. And we'll go into depth into describing it, defining it. And we're going to present to you some examples from uh, what we're building, which can really kind of explain to you the power of inter interoperability um, as it applies to our use case. So as I mentioned, we're building Geyser. And Geyser is a lightning native uh, Bitcoin crowdfunding platform. So we're really talking here about the application layer uh, of Bitcoin. We've heard uh, Alan Bits talk about kind of protocol um, uh, tooling. Um, um, uh, and what we're doing at Geyser is really trying to solve uh, just bringing all the tools um, uh, that Bitcoin and Lightning offer to creators, to educators, to builders um, that essentially can, in a non-custodial way, receive donations, um, uh, receive donations directly or via rewards um, and in a, in a way that is also non-custodial. So we're going to go into more depth into what we're doing at Geyser, but uh, basically yeah, we're going to talk about uh, interoperability. So um, key questions are going to be how can platforms uh, leverage protocols um, and the kind of distinction between, you know, what's the difference between platforms and protocols um, and explore this idea that will protocols kill platforms is sort of a recurring theme that often comes up in the Bitcoin space. And then really trying to understand what is going to be the relationship that we see going forward between platforms uh, and protocols. What is that sort of uh, relationship between the two? And just to go straight to the, like, the main point that we have is that the idea is that platforms uh, can leverage protocols, and by doing so, they can reach wider audiences. Um, and doing so with minimal effort and with potentially exponential benefits. And we're going to go into more depth and to explain how. And then uh, the, the main point is that they provide better experiences for the end users and therefore kind of create this kind of really uh, symbiotic relationship between platforms and, and protocols. So we'll th first talk a little bit about what is Geyser, then talk about what interoperability, and then show you some of the examples in terms of what, what do we mean here. Um, again, Geyser is this uh, uh, crowdfunding platform, and the, the main problem that we're trying to solve here is uh, that we found that it was hard for a lot of Bitcoin creators, be they educators, be they um, uh, builders or makers, uh, to reach and engage their, their communities. So um, how many of you guys have used the uh, traditional crowdfunding platforms, I don't know, like a Kickstarter or, uh, there you go, yeah, quite a few of them, of you guys. Um, but uh, the problem of them is that they kind of exclude uh, the majority of the world population. They really only work in the West. They only work in Europe and, and uh, North America and Australia, and thereby uh, excluding the rest of, of the population. The reason for that is just because they work on these uh, legacy financial rails Right, so if you're in Nigeria, if you're in Argentina, or if you're in the Philippines, uh, you can forget about using these tools. Um, and if you think about it, crowdfunding is quite a very basic kind of um, uh, uh, kind of basic tooling for f of finance. Right, it's really about uh, donations or exchange in a very simple way with no not many strings attached. So it's um, it's a very important tool if you think about the internet ecosystem and economy. Uh, to have something like that that is global uh, and um, that can really actually also help to connect the world, uh, uh, as the guys were talking about earlier. Another problem is that platforms uh, often isolate. Um, uh, they kind of, you have to go to Kickstarter to fund the project. You can't really do that from other platforms or from other places, so they isolate you. And um, yeah, force contributors to fund from the platform. And also often, as we've seen recently, they freeze campaign accounts. Um, so our solution is, as you can see here, a lightning native crowdfunding platform. And um, this is kind of what, what it looks like. Um, it's global because it's based on Bitcoin and on Lightning. 
it's platform agnostic in the sense that you can f fund projects uh, not from the platform, but from your wallet, uh, from um, um, Twitter, from <laughs> anywhere really, as we'll show you. It's also non-custodial, and you can use your own node, you can use Voltage, uh, and very soon you'll be able to use your Lightning address to just create your project, and all the funds will go straight to your custodial address. And also it's reward-based, so you don't, it's not just about donations, but it's about you can also get something back, and it could be physical goods, or also coming up will be more digital type of goods as well. So the idea is that we call this borderless crowdfunding, uh, that really bridges beyond geographic barriers and also bridges beyond platform barriers. And again, we'll explain a little bit more what we mean in a second. Um, the benefits is that I think from a platform's perspective, um, tying into these lightning uh, protocols help, helped us reach new audiences uh, and also help creators uh, of these projects reach new audiences as well. Uh, and uh, it helps contributors fund more easily and uh, fund from anywhere. So what we're going to see is that it just increases the amount of activity that happens thanks to this open uh, borderless uh, protocol that we're leveraging. Uh, yeah, now I'll pass it on to Stelios, who will talk about inter interoperability. Thank you, Rick. Bye. All right, so what is interoperability? There's probably different definitions that you can come up with for interoperability. Uh, we're going to look at it from the perspective of platforms, really. And so we'll say it's basically the ability of platforms to exchange and make use of information. Now, what is the current state of uh, interoperability on the web? It's really not as good as it could be. Uh, and for that, we, we kind of have to go back a little bit and think about where a lot of these platforms came from. When you look at uh, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Netflix, you know, you name it, these, these massive companies really were the first, the first companies to reach that scale in their particular use case. So when they were building it, they weren't really thinking about how can I interoperate with the other platforms that are building a similar use case. They were really trying to build something that is going to reach a massive scale and then on their own with their own solution. And with interoperability, you're thinking about things a little bit differently because you're thinking about how can I build uh, a protocol that is going to be useful and used by a lot of different platforms. Now, there's kind of two different ways that you can think about doing an integration like that. Um, one is the protocol that we'll talk a lot about. And the other one that perhaps if you're a developer, you might be more familiar with is doing something like a REST uh, or um, an API integration. And on, on the next slide here, yep, um, we have some pretty high level graphics just to give up the idea that there's a massive difference as a business to do an API integration versus doing a, a protocol based integration. And that is here the difference between the effort you have to put into it and the value you're going to get out of it. Um, and when you look at the effort, we have the blue line here that is showing the API integration. And it's kind of a linear, a linear trend. Like every new integration that you're going to use with a, an API-based uh, integration is going to be an additional effort that you have to do. Maybe you have to go through the, the documentation of the other company. Um, you know, maybe you have to talk to the, their developer team, understand how their system works. They have to understand how your system works. And then, you know, happy days, maybe you get it working and people use it and they love it. Um, and then the value you're going to get out of it is just as much value as the, the um, API you're integrating with. Uh, and, and so the value you're getting out of it is also sort of this linear, linear kind of trend that you're seeing there. With protocols, it's completely different because you're not looking at it from the perspective of an individual platform. You're looking at it from the standards perspective of how does communication happen. And so the integration effort that you do as a platform is kind of a one-time effort. It's kind of a constant. You're just looking at what does the specification say? Let me implement that into my platform. And then, by definition, I'll be able to interoperate with all the different services that are building on top of that same protocol. And so the value I'm getting out of that 
is sort of uh, an exponential. Uh, and the reason we have this sort of exponential uh, curve here is that today I might integrate with certain protocols with maybe five different companies or platforms that are doing that, but tomorrow they might be 10. The next year they might be 20. And so every new person that comes on just grows the network effect of that integration and everyone benefits within the network. Um, and so to keep this kind of grounded in, in reality and not just talk theory, we're going to showcase how that works uh, with four different protocols that are related to, to Lightning and how we've integrated that onto our platform and seen sort of real use case coming out of that. Um, so before I, I get into each one of the, the individual ones, I just want to have a quick show of hands of which one of you is familiar with podcasting 2.0? Okay, fair enough. Uh, WebLN, yeah, less hands already. LNURL, cool, we had some talks before talking about LNURL, and then finally Lightning Addresses. Awesome. So I'll start with Podcasting 2.0. For those that don't know, it's uh, building on top of the existing podcasting trend that has been growing, and a lot of people love listening to podcasts in their free time. Um, but it's kind of missing this layer of value to be able to give out value directly to the creator of the podcast. And so with Podcasting 2.0, you're integrating Lightning into your listening experience, and you can set uh, a fee rate per minute, like a number of Satoshis per minute, and then stream those Satoshis as you're listening to the podcast. And that in and of itself is already really cool. Uh, and what it has enabled us to do with, with Geyser is that by integrating Podcasting 2.0, we're actually connecting the podcasts of the creator that might also have a, a Geyser project, and then whoever is listening to the podcast, maybe they were invited on as a guest, and they don't run their own podcast, but they're part of the, the SAT streaming, and so the Satoshis are streamed directly into their crowdfunding campaign. Now, imagine that with Spotify and Kickstarter, right? how would that look like? It, it would just be very difficult to do with the current financial system. But that is what we can do with Lightning. You could have the equivalent experience of you listening to your favorite Spotify podcast and then funding directly as you listen a project that is on Kickstarter. Ma imagine funding uh, Joe Rogan um, as you're listening to him or his, his host uh, regarding to his you know, particular uh, cause, right? That's, that's quite powerful if you think about it. Super powerful, absolutely. Um, and this is not just theory, we're not just dreaming here. Um, these are the numbers we're kind of seeing on the platform right now. About 4% of all the contributors that we've had on the platform came from podcasting 2.0 integrations. Uh, from you know wallets like uh, Breeze and, and Fountain doing a great job in that uh, in that area, uh, and that represented about 27% of the transactions. And although that's a pretty high percentage, really the value was still pretty low. It, it's still a pretty new a new concept, and and people are playing with it, and not really sending a lot of value through that. Uh, but we're seeing 4% of contributors that would not have existed without this integration. These are not people that visited or would have visited Geyser if they were not able to use the podcasting integration. And to really drive the point home about the effort versus value, we did this one integration and we didn't talk to more than one wallet. We just talked with one, exchanged some ideas, and then from that, we were interoperable with eight different uh, podcasting applications. And we expect this number to just keep growing and the amount of effort we have to put into that is minimal, if, if not uh, none. The next protocol is called LNURL Pay. And it's kind of a wrapper around uh, the traditional Bolt 11 invoices that you have on Lightning. And they allow you to basically have a static QR code. Now, if you're familiar with Lightning a little bit, Normally, every time you want to make a payment, you have to generate a new invoice, pay that invoice, it's a one-time invoice, and so you have like this interactivity that, that has to take place. With LNURL Pay, it's kind of different. You just have this static invoice, and then in the background, it will fetch the invoice for you. And that allows us to do some pretty cool 
cool new new things. Uh, and one of them that you're seeing here from, from Twitter, this is Hero of Bitcoin, one really cool project on, on the Geyser platform that I recommend you check out. Um, and we've created these Geyser posters. And the poster has a little description of, of the project itself, and then this QR code. And this QR code can actually be scanned by any Lightning wallet that also integrates with LNURL Pay. And so you could already from here, from this slide that I'm showing you, you could scan this QR code and send some Satoshis to the project. We didn't have to go on Geyser, right? We're, we're just sharing this on Twitter, uh, or you could be sharing this on your car that is racing. And you could be funding the racing car as it is racing, uh, and maybe placing bet. I don't know. Uh, but that's like a really cool use case that, uh, again, would not have been possible without Lightning and the interoperability. So again, with LNURL Pay, about 5% of contributors that um, we've seen on the platform came from through this route. Uh, and that would, again, not, th those funders would not have existed uh, without LNURL Pay. I think I'll pass it on to you. Cool, thank you. So another protocol is uh, Lightning Addresses, which is really like this um, abstraction layer on top of LNURL Pay. Um, and it's it, it's abstraction that creates this uh, ident internet identifier, uh, a bit like it looks. If you think about it, it looks exactly like an email, except uh, it's it's uh, connected to basically a Lightning wallet. So it's like a static Lightning address that you can use and reuse and share with people. And people will be able to use to send you funds directly to your um, uh, to your to your to your to your wallet. And it's like a push rather than a pull like uh, the, the normal Lightning uh, Bolt 11 invoices work. Um, and uh, the cool thing about it is that it's something that it's very uh, usable, reusable, you, it's memorizable. You can uh, remember it and share it with, with your friends just like you do with your email. Um, so we, we, we're very bullish on Lightning addresses. And just like email was like the, the initial um, stepping stone into the world of the internet, we think Lightning addresses um, uh, will be the same tool for, for the masses when it comes to uh, sending and receiving uh, payments on Lightning. So we've integrated with Lightning addresses. Uh, and another important tool actually I should mention, uh, or, or reason why it's powerful is because it can act as a bridge uh, between platforms. So let me show you guys what I mean. So. Um, so I'm not sure how many of you guys, how, have, you guys have heard of Machankura, uh, maybe a quick show of hands, but it's quite as, uh, esoteric. But basically, they're using this really cool technology called USSD that it's kind of like the same technology that backs SMSs um, uh, to allow users in places in Africa that don't have smartphones and don't have internet connection to pay uh, each other uh, on uh, w without internet, so you're basically uh, c um, using the cellular uh, data networks to send money, to send Bitcoin uh, on Lightning. And the way that it works is that you you do it, um, you send money to Lightning addresses. So they also integrated with Lightning addresses, as did we. And what happens what happened last week is that somebody funded a project on Geyser. Uh, it's a bit hard to see, but it's a BFF at Geyser.fund uh, using one of these, you know, you know uh, shitcoin phones, I guess you could call them. I don't know. <laughs> They're pretty, like, old phones, right? And you could fund without even internet connection to a project on Geyser using Lightning Address. That kind of shows you how mind-blowing the power of interoperability is. Every single new service that integrates with Lightning Addresses will be interoperable and be able to connect to what we have. So we thought this was incredibly cool. Uh, another really cool tool is, well, uh, uh, Danny from Coin Corner uh, the other day used uh, Coin Corner. They're also a Lightning um, uh, exchange um, where you can buy Bitcoin, definitely recommend it. And they've also integrated Lightning addresses. And they also have a service where from Coin Corner you can subscribe to a project and send uh, recurring payments every day or every week or every month. And so Danny uh, decided to send the recurring payments to BFF, which is Bitcoin uh, for Freedom, uh, for Fairness, at geyser.fund. Uh, and so every, <laughs> every day, I believe, he was sending 1,000 Satoshis. 
uh, that will be going to the project directly. Uh, and this is uh, incredibly powerful, again, the power of interoperability. Um, now we're waiting for subscriptions to come to the next, um, uh, um, the next sort of patch, I guess you could call it, of Lightning, um, uh, which will allow users from Geysers, uh, from Guru Geyser as well, and uh, from Geyser directly, uh, subscribe. So essentially, um, uh, subscribe from their own uh, from their own wallets. Another interesting tool was Lightning addresses. Um, uh, for Lightning Addresses is this uh, widget that was created by Rene Aaron, where you can simply connect your Lightning address uh, and uh, have, use this plugin on your website or anywhere uh, where you can essentially uh, plug it, uh, add your Lightning address, and then people can fund you from your, from your website, from your blog, from whatever. You don't have to come to Geyser, uh, but we will, we will re uh, see that transaction and make that and kind of... Uh, uh, make that part of that, uh, make that into a contribution uh, towards your crowdfunding campaign. So again, another example of uh, interoperability, uh, borderless crowdfunding, where you don't need to come to us, we, we see that transaction happening directly from, even though it's happening from somewhere else. Uh, another cool project is Satsback. They allow you to earn sats for every transaction you make in the real world, every payment. Uh, and um, you can withdraw your funds towards a Lightning address. Again, that Lightning address could be a project on Geyser. You could be funding a project from Satsback. Um, imagine using your visa and funding a project directly from your visa to a, um, uh, a Kickstarter project. Like, you can't do that, right? By buying your bread. Right. You're buying your bread. You get Satsback, and that flow directly to, your, to, a, to, a, to a project, uh, to a crowdfunding project, yeah. It's sort of the power of interoperability. And so when it comes to Lightning addresses, this is probably the, like the biggest, the biggest uh, number of contributions that came from outside our platform. We're talking about 7% uh, of all uh, the contributors having uh, made their contribution from outside the platform using just Lightning addresses. So this is quite, um, it's quite a, big, uh, a big number of people. And again, no additional build time for each additional integration. People just keep on Every platform that integrates with Lightning addresses will be interoperable with Geyser at no extra cost, uh, and again, the with the potential of exponential uh, number of new users coming in. Right, um, WebLN um, is a similar type of uh, protocol, basically uh, that allows you to make payments using your uh, your web client or your browser. Uh, it's really built to bypass QR code, so it's quite quite smooth to use. You don't have to scan anything. It's like in integrated in your browser or this desktop and mobile. And this is a quick example. Uh, you can just like click fund. You know, we show, the, we show this uh, 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 kind of uh, browser extension pop-up, and you just say click OK. And um, on mobile, it works with uh, Breeze, um, Blix, any platform that has integrated uh, uh, WebLN. Uh, it was hard for us to define exactly the number of contributions for this one for technical reasons, uh, but uh, again, contributor number go up, uh, speed and immediacy of funding even higher, uh, no added build time. Anyone that integrates with WebLAN will rise the number of contributors on our on our platform. So to wrap all of this uh, all of this up, um, these are all the different protocols we discuss, and what you see here is that 20% of all contributors. Uh, and all contributions that have been made on Geyser uh, have come from outside the platform, thanks to these uh, protocols. Again, if we had not, these are like extra users to us, and that's 20% uh, of these users came from these uh, protocol integrations, um, and really shows the power of uh, the power of interoperability, uh, the power of these open monetary networks uh, such as Lightning, and all these li protocols on top of Lightning. So uh, again, these are extra users. Uh, really, kind of show, bring the point home that like it's it's a, a, an added benefit to open up to these to these uh, uh, these protocol, and we expect this to kind of go up and maybe even reach 50% uh, by next year as the number of platform applications that integrate into these different protocols uh, increase. And the cool thing is that 
it's so unexpected. Like you could have an incredible new application on Lightning that integrates Lightning addresses, and people could be sending SATs from there to our project. Um, we wouldn't even need to do any integration. It would just happen, and it would just uh, yeah, it's a beautiful thing uh, with unexpected benefits, and uh, I guess you could call them uh, positive externalities. Yeah, so what does it tell us about the future of the web? Can we, can we take this example and say, okay, what, what does the, the web, the new web, look like? Uh, one way of seeing it is like um, the famous Gigi said this really cool quote um, where if we get this right, we might be able to free ourselves from the evolutionary survival of the richest environment of platforms, allowing ourselves to step into the quasi-immortal realm of protocols. So is it, are we moving towards a world where People don't need to build plat uh, platforms. It's all about protocols. There's obviously, you know, the Web3 community that'll say, oh, blockchains are the future. Let's do, let's issue our own tokens. Let's throw NFTs and metaverse in there as well. Is that the future of the web? Well, we're not, we don't quite think so. I think the, what we're starting to see with our example is uh, this power of interoperability between platforms and protocols. Uh, and we think the next web will be about platforms integrating and sim kind of creating this interplay and symbiosis between platforms and protocols, where uh, each platforms and protocols have something to earn and uh, learn and uh, grow from, from this interplay. So platforms really do and can leverage protocols if they want to scale. Uh, if they also want to remain neutral and not uh, censor uh, and help build bridges between platforms and applications. Uh, on the other hand, protocols do need platforms, actually. Uh, contrary to popular belief, we've seen a lot of growth on uh, several platforms that had application layer platforms um, uh, sustain, enable, and fund protocol development. So protocols do need platforms in our, in our, in our way of thinking to build them uh, and adopt them and provide incre increased end user value. Protocols are great for the sort of open source world, but you do need something at the application layer that provides that end user value and that um, um, uh, kind of interface layer application that, people, that makes it smooth and easy for people to use. Most people usually don't or shouldn't, uh, or should, but uh, don't always uh, you know, work at a protocol level. They need applications to make the experience smooth. Pro so protocols enable platforms to reach more users um, uh, uh, beyond their own existing platforms. As we showed, 20% of our users came from outside the platform, and um, they can also enhance the user experiences, right? Because without these protocols, you wouldn't be able to fund using QR codes, static QR codes, or no QR codes, uh, or widgets, or mobile, or browsers, right? Um, so increase the, the pr leveraging these protocols enabled us to increase the user experience for the end user um, with minimal effort in terms of uh, integration and allowed us to grow our network effects uh, into like, you know, and, and the use of new uh, use cases, right? So as we mentioned, so many people sending money from all these different applications. And platforms enable protocols, on the other hand, to define the requirements, right? So when you're building a protocol, you have to think, like, who's going to use this, right? And it's platforms that help to define, like, what type of, what are these use cases and define the requirements. Um, so we've had, actually, we've helped, as Stelios will describe in a bit, to actually develop uh, and improve the LN URL uh, uh, protocol sp specifications because we are facing with real users. Um, and so we understand what the challenges are that users are facing, and we're therefore we're able to have that conversation. We're sort of sitting between the user and the protocol so we can get that feedback back to protocol development. And uh, yeah, platforms can help protocols have vibrant ecosystems on top of which to build and also fund protocol development. Again, some of our resources went into supporting this protocol development and uh, provide a, a needed profit incentive to build in on the space and, uh, yeah, and also br uh, bring in uh, new use cases as well. 
So I'll pass it over back to Stelios to talk about this. So we're, we're a little bit over time, and I'll, I'll go through this quickly. Um, what's next for Geyser is really uh, deliver on our, uh, on our mission to make crowdfunding available to everyone and anyone around the world and make it really easy to create a project, whether you're running your own node uh, and using Connect the World Ring of Fires to, to run a better node, or whether you're not as technical and you just want to connect your own wallet, you'll be able to do that with Lightning addresses um, using existing services like GetAlbi, uh, Bitnob in, in Nigeria, and Wallet of Satoshi that I'm sure is the most popular beginner's wallet to get started with Lightning. We're also thinking about interoperability beyond Lightning um, with integrations uh, or, or rather interoperability of content using technologies like Nostra and Slash Tags so that the content published on what platform can be shared across different platforms and um, this idea of one-time effort for added value is no longer just for the platforms, but also for the user himself uh, that just posts once and, and distributes it everywhere. So that's it for us uh, and on interoperability. If you're also bullish on interoperability and you want to join us and, and help us build it, we are hiring. Uh, you can reach out to us on, uh, at hello at geyser.fund. We're also pretty active on Twitter at geyser.fund. Um, and of course, do check out the, the very cool projects that are being crowdfunded currently on the, on the platform. Um, you have the URL there uh, at the bottom of the slide. Thank you. Thank you.